Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's spend some time talking about Chapter 4, Material Control. We all need to utilize some supplies and equipment in our labs and in our shops. So how do we keep track of all of that stuff? Well, Chapter 4 has a whole lot to say about that. And so let's take a look at some storage methods. One of the things we want to do with our storage methods is to locate frequently used tools and instruments close to the general work area. You don't want students crossing each other and your traffic patterns to be chaotic like that. You want students to be able to move from one area to the other very, very quickly. And so the easiest thing to do is to keep the, those tools and instruments that they're going to need stored very close to their work area to cut down on the, uh, the number of steps they've got to take. You also want to arrange your tools for fast visual access and inspection. Um, in a woodworking lab, you would want to have all your tools laid out so that student can say, well, I, I need a, a saw or I need a um, chisel or something like that then they could look at the uh, tool board, find it right off the bat, go get it, and, and keep working. And then you want portable and infrequently used instruments should only be issued at the beginning of class. Um, with all the activity that's taken place in a lab setting, you don't have time to go out there and uh, find equipment, find supplies that a student needs. They should have their plan of work ready before they begin the lab exercise to make sure that they've got their, their portable or uh, instruments ready for them uh, if, if and when they need them, instead of having to go out there and uh, bug you to, uh, to get all of that stuff during class. They need to learn how to manage their work and organize their, uh, their their work and their work area. So it's a good way to kind of get that point across by stressing that. So what about tool and equipment storage? You can have either open or lockable panels which are mounted on the walls or on casters. Um, if I had to, to make a choice, I'd want lockable panels because um, inevitably, if you have an open set of panels, that's just a temptation for somebody to walk off with um, something. So I would say go with lockable. And you should have a storage room that's located within the laboratory. They don't have to go across a hall or... Uh, outside of that lab or lab slash classroom area where they can have a storage area to store their projects or store equipment and supplies, whatever it is. You should have a central supply room which serve numerous labs within an occupational cluster. And so um, some schools have their storage area that's shared by a number of, um, of shop of shops um, and so like that you can kind of cluster and share uh, equipment that's um, generic to all the clusters so it just um, helps you to kind of save on buying multiple uh, types of that kind of equipment so that uh, you can kind of save some money. One could be used for four different um, programs, where, whereas uh, in other situations you have to buy four of the same piece of equipment. And then you've got uh, some tool instrument kits which contain a complete set of frequently used tools and instruments. Uh, in the case of our um, our machine shop program. 
uh, they will have a set of tools like uh, calipers or uh, micrometers. Uh, comes in a case and they'll go from like one inch to three inch sets of micrometers. Uh, and that set stays there. Uh, it's tagged as a as a set. The students, when they check out that uh, set of, uh, of instruments, get the whole set. They don't just get one piece out of it. And so you need to be able to store those kinds of uh, instruments that have many, many parts to them. Uh, in auto mechanics, you have all kinds of specialized uh, types of sets of instrument or testing kits that all have many, many parts to them. It's great to have some kind of uh, case or uh, toolbox that will store all of that stuff because it's so, so easy to lose one part of that tool set and then uh, you wind up that being the part that you need. And so you can't find it and, and so learning doesn't take place. So have a spot for uh, tool kits or instrumentation kits because some of these could be quite bulky, especially in the case of like a, a a set of sockets or automotive tools. You would need a whole lot of room to move uh, those kind of kits around. And so what's some of the ways that you and I can come up with an effective distribution and control system or as your uh, chapter talks about con uh, distribution and control concepts. Well, one of the things that uh, you and I have to to, to come to grips with real quick whenever we, we're, we're hired as a uh, shop instructor is that you and I will take responsibility for the lab and its contents. You and I are responsible for everything in there to make sure that it's clean, make sure that it's all the parts are there and it's kept up and well maintained. Because we don't want to waste public, public property purchased with public funds. Let's face it, taxpayers of this state pay a whole lot of money and they expect you and I to be able to uh, be good stewards of that investment. And let's face it, what worse kind of uh, image can you portray to the general public at large? It's when your students are, are going home and saying, mom, dad, uh, we try to do some, some work today in, in the lab and uh, all these pieces of equipment are broken and all of the tools can't find them. That is a very bad uh, public image problem. And let's face it, if we aren't good stewards, uh, whenever we're going to go to the public and ask for funds, ask for support, they're not going to give it. And so we don't want to waste what resources we do have. So we have to be responsible. And certainly we can help our students model good work behavior by, by having an organized and effective distribution system that encourages and sets examples for good work habits. For many uh, of our students, they're going to see the same thing whenever they go to work. They'll check out tools. They'll be responsible for them, and they'll have to bring them back. Uh, especially those students that may go to work uh, in turnarounds in, in some of the plants in Lake Charles or in uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, happens all the time. And so we need to model that kind of behavior so that our, our students can... Uh, also learn it. It discourages the borrowing of instruments and tools from the school. Now, let's face it, many times our school labs are very, very well equipped. And a lot of times individuals from, and let's be honest, both from within 
our school systems and outside of our school systems will sometimes look at us as a resource for tools and equipment that they don't have that they would like to, to borrow. Well, remember, that's not my tool. That's not your tool. That actually belongs to the state. And so if something happens that it gets damaged, broken, or let's face it, worst case scenario, never returned, it's on us. And there are some very bad things that, that can happen when that kind of uh, situation takes place. And so if it's in a tool, uh, tool locker, if it's in a uh, secure place and, and, and you've got the only key, then nobody has to be able to come in and be able to borrow some tools from you. And that kind of leads into the next point, missing instruments and tools limit student lab work. You've got broken welding machines, they can't weld. Uh, you don't have enough uh, food or enough uh, cooking supplies, students can't cook. So you've got to be able to keep your uh, equipment maintained and have an adequate supply uh, of materials available for students to work with. And certainly, student morale declines greatly when needed implements are missing. They get very discouraged and very depressed real quickly. And let's face it, we don't want our students uh, sitting around because that just gives them a, an opportunity uh, to get into to all kinds of mischief. So. They need to be active, they need to be engaged, they need to be on task. And so our tools, our equipment, our supplies need to be relative, readily, I'm, uh, I mean to say, readily available to them uh, as they progress through their, uh, their lab work. So what are some ways to kind of distribute tools to our students and um, we have some forms right here one and probably the most common is numbered disc you get yourself a little metal disc put a number on it and tag your uh, your piece of equipment and so what will happen is that uh, let's say you have a, a wrench that is uh, that a student needs to take all a part of a uh, piece on the on the front end of a car well they go to the tool room someone who's in the tool room gets that uh, tool and then places a little metal disc with a number on it and then gives a student uh, the tool and then has a second disc with the same number on it. And so the student uh, has to give that number, that, that disc back with the number when they bring the tool back. And so it's really very easy for uh, people to be able to check and see if there's missing tools or anything like that at, at the end of class by just looking at the tool board and see if there's anything missing, but then also making sure that there are two little metal disc uh, next to each uh, piece of equipment to show that it had been returned by uh, a student. The second is a paper list. Uh, some tool rooms will just have a, a form that if uh, John Smith comes and needs a, uh, the same part, person working the tool room writes their name down says what part it was what time they checked it out and then when they get it done with it they'll have a time that they check back in and many times they'll also have them initialed the uh, the form that they did return it um, if you want to get really um, I guess 
real world, you can do a tool or material request form. You can have a whole bunch of forms printed out that uh, student brings to the tool room, requesting that uh, that tool from the tool room, and then whoever's working the tool room will then approve that request, keep it on file right there, and then when it's returned, show that it's been returned and uh, and signed. Now, I guess in a perfect world, we, we could get by with number four. And maybe there are some situations where you could get by with the honor system. That you could just trust your students enough to uh, go out there, get their tools, do what they have to do with them, and, and bring them right back. Um, I'm afraid I'm not there yet. And... Um, I got a feeling if you go to the honor system, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, maybe I, I'm just, just because I'm an old, burnt out teacher, perhaps, but the um, honor system to me would be very, very impractical for a whole lot of uh, classroom situations. And so that leads to the last point, and probably maybe the, the best method of all is if you had a teacher aide that you could um, give the responsibility to to work to, uh, and make sure that uh, tools are passed out in a uh, organized and efficient manner. Uh, that, that person could uh, just do that and make sure that everything that's checked out is always checked back in before the end of class. And... Um, Unfortunately, I don't uh, know a whole lot of uh, shop instructors who are that fortunate to have a teacher aide uh, that could do that, much less help them for other things uh, there in in class. And so maybe those of you that, uh, that do have them, uh, count yourselves very, very fortunate. And so how do we control our supplies? How do we disperse them and then control them? Well, your author makes, makes the point that throughout the, this country's history, we have worked to provide a free and public education to all the kids uh, born here in this country. We believe it's a, a, a right that people have to an education. And our government... Uh, on the federal, state, and local level spends a whole lot of money every year on the education of students in, the, in, in public schools. We're not talking about parochial or private schools here. Uh, those students who want to go to those schools, that's a choice that uh, their parents or guardians have, have made. But in most public schools, there's a, a number of ways that students can do work in a lab and depending upon the type of lab, be able to get projects done to learn some skills or else do uh, book work, lab work to, to get things done. And so one of the things they can do is to for the student to pay for projects for personal use away from school. Let's say if you're teaching in a woodworking lab, a um, student wants to make a bookcase, then they will go out and purchase the wood. They do the uh, estimation, take off, see what it's going to cost for the wood, what type of wood they, they, they need, uh, what kind of finishing supplies. Uh, and so forth that they're going to need and they go out and purchase that and then somewhere or another get it to the school and then once there it's there then they can start their project uh, another way is for lab fees uh, in college you were in chemistry lab or biology lab or botany lab 
you paid a, a lab fee to cover all of the supplies, chemicals, whatever it was that, that you're going to use in that uh, laboratory experience while, while you were there. And finally, you know, certainly uh, Carl Perkins will pay for supplies, uh, perhaps other uh, sources of funding within the public and also post-secondary schools can certainly uh, be used for that. Grants and so forth uh, can, can be written to provide supplies at no cost to the students. But um, last and certainly not least, uniforms and tools. There are some uh, school systems that uh, require that their students wear school uniforms. Uh, there are some technical schools that also have the same requirement where in some pro programs they'll have to wear a uniform like in the health field uh, they need a, a set of scrubs. I know like at our school we have a different color set of scrubs for for all of the health occupation fields. Our, uh, our CNAs are I think black in their uh, uh, their scrub color. Our uh, nurse, uh, nursing students are this uh, dark blue type of color. Our uh, medical assistants have gray scrubs. And finally, our uh, pharmacy tech students have bright, bright red scrubs. And so that kind of gives them an identity and also, certainly, it's part of the, uh, the program. They're, they are required to purchase those kinds of uh, things. So, those are some things that, you know, certainly cost when it comes to uh, keeping our supplies up to speed. Uh, and let's face it, right now, uh, I think all of our budgets are probably not where, where, where we'd want them to be. Uh, I don't know of a whole lot of programs and a whole lot of people who have basically a, an un, unending amount of money going into their, uh, their, their programs. We've got to really kind of pinch pennies and make our, our budget stretch as far as we possibly can. And the fact of the matter is that our programs are expensive. Supplies do cost a whole lot of money right now. And, and unfortunately, it's not like the, the costs are get, is getting less. Uh, they're only in, increasing. And our, and our budgets aren't increasing to match. So, uh, quite honestly, I don't know how much longer we're going to really be able to keep up the quality of uh, training and development that we, we have if our budgets don't uh, increase significantly for us to be able to keep our equipment maintained and up to date. And then also buy the supplies that, that, that we need uh, for our students to have some very meaningful uh, lab experiences. Here are some supply distribution methods. Uh, getting back to the requisition form, it's really no problem to create a form on Word or uh, Adobe Acrobat. They can uh, do those kinds of things. I'm not uh, very familiar with the supply purchase cards. I don't ever remember seeing that done, but uh, every student has a card and uh, when they, let's say, need something from, our, from, from, from your supply uh, cabinet, then you will write that down and uh, 
they'll have you know x amount of dollars that they can spend over a, a semester period and and so when they reach that 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 limit either they have to pay more or else uh, they can't do it anymore but one of the things that you and I do not ever want to get involved with is whenever we deal with cash payments but students bring lab fees uh, and bring their money to our class. Um, the last thing that you and I want to do is to handle that kind of money. We need to bring it to somebody who's bonded and uh, authorized to be able to handle that money. And that's usually the, the, the school accountants or, uh, or, or office workers. Um, that is just a recipe for disaster. If uh, you and I uh, hang on to that money, uh, even if we've got it all in a nice little box, uh, in a safe deposit box in our uh, classroom. There's no telling that student will, students will uh, break in, steal that money. Uh, once the word gets out that there's money in that in your office or in that classroom, but what's worse is that is the accountability for that money uh, just some students thinking well old man so-and-so has uh, got all that money I bet, he, I bet he's using it for something else uh, and let's face it how can you and I prove that uh, we're not if we don't have some system in place to, uh, to account for it. And that's why the best thing to do is to run it through those people uh, who handle school finances. And like that, you and I don't have to, to worry about any kind of uh, issues that might come up because of someone th thinking that we're trying, that we're stealing money or that we're uh, not giving the students what they deserve for what they paid for. So don't do it. Of course, uh, unfortunately, there are some instructors that do that. And they, th they say that, you know, they couldn't survive if they didn't have a little pot of money, that they could go out and buy parts or buy uh, supplies when they needed it. But uh, personally, I don't think it's worth the risk. So be warned. And then finally, the system must be understood by the students. They need to have a clear understanding, as well as those that uh, in the secondary schools whose parents are uh, footing the bill. They need to have a very clear understanding of if a lab fee is paid or if something is paid, then who handles it, uh, how the money is dispersed, and uh, that whole system needs to be as transparent as, as possible to keep from any kinds of issues coming up, both in the school and outside the school. Our inventory control. We've got to have some way that we can kind of keep track of what we have in our classroom, both in the way of supplies and equipment. And normally every year, we all go through an inventory. Well, the inventory control is essential for budget preparations. If you, if a school system wants to uh, do some expansion or do some uh, remodeling work or try to repair, uh, they need to know what they have, the condition of what they have, and then be able to draw up some some plans to see what they need to do to expand or repair. Your inventory control will also help to guard against waste. You know, I don't know a whole lot of uh, instructors who have so much lab space that they can buy tons of, uh, of stuff. And look, there's some times where you and I know of some kind of supply that you and I 
need. And all of a sudden, there's some money that we have to spend before the end of the year. And look, that's a great opportunity to go out there and get some very critical supplies that you need and have sort of a, a an inventory of them. More often than not, we're usually start trying to scrape by to get through the end of a, a, a school year. But having an inventory and one that we can put our hands on, we can pretty well say, okay, I, 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 I have identified these items and these things always run out before the end of the school year. And so anytime I can get an opportunity to buy more of that, I'll find some place to store all that stuff. So whenever that time comes, I'm not shutting down my, my program because I can't go on because I don't have that supply that I need. So we don't want to waste, but anytime we can have a chance to kind of put a little, little away, we should never miss it. Security of lab equipment and material. We've got to have some place to lock it up because unfortunately those things will walk away. You know, I hate, I hate to sound like that, but that's just the facts of life. Uh, every uh, place that I've worked, there's always been issues with uh, those kinds of things uh, with uh, security. Consumable supplies. Things like welding rods or the wire, um, gasoline, diesel. There's all kinds of supplies that we consume. If you're in drafting, you've got uh, erasers, uh, pencil lead, things like that, that uh, you have to replace once it's uh, consumed. So we need adequate inventories of those, those kinds of uh, consumables. But then we also have non-consumable supplies, like our, uh, yeah, uh, a, lot, a lot of times, hand tools will be uh, identified as non-consumables, uh, like a hand drill, power drill. Uh, students are gonna use it and use it and use it, and then all of a sudden, you know, with use, it's gonna break. Well, many times it's easier just to go ahead and throw the thing away than to try to get it fixed. And so we, we purchase a replacement. But the drills, uh, the drills th themselves uh, can last quite a while for us. And of course, he, Another type of inventory we need to, uh, to keep track of is our equipment. Um, all of those lathes, engines, computers, and things like that that we have in our, in our classroom that are essential for us to be able to do training on. Uh, we need to have those tagged and an accurate inventory kept of those things throughout the year. And then furniture. Uh, our labs need desks. They, they, they need tables and all kinds of other furniture that uh, are essential for our students to be able to work comfortably. And then finally, multimedia and audiovisual supplies. Uh, I don't know of any of uh, vocational labs today that don't uh, make a great use of these kinds of things to help enhance in, in instruction. Well, you and I need to have some kind of place to be able to, uh, to put those things. If we have a, a Promethean board or a smart board, um, those are very very expensive pieces of equipment. They are, they are tagged and inventoried, um, but then we can also have projectors and laptops and all kinds of other uh, things to play our audio visual uh, equipment uh, and also place to store and keep inventory 
of all of those discs and tapes and things like that that we use from time to time in our instruction. And then we look at the quantity estimates. How do you and I estimate for a, a year of what kind of supplies that you're gonna, you and I are going to need? Well, one way we can do it is to look at the rate of past use and kind of add 10% to that. So if you used, you know, 20 gallons of gas uh, last year to uh, in, in, in your small engine uh, class, and maybe you might want to go up to 22 gallons this year. Provide yourself enough funding to be able to, to buy that kind of uh, amount. But just knowing what you s s used or spent the year before can certainly uh, make that job pretty easy. And then look at the anticipated future use. Are you expecting to have more students, less students next year? And so you can kind of adjust your numbers by just knowing uh, that kind of information. And another way uh, I don't know whether that would work that well for the technical college teachers, but certainly those in, in secondary situations, your performance objective analysis. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have had the uh, methods class. One of the things you had to do was to uh, create yourself a set of performance objectives. And so that um, performance objective uh, was quite specific in the what was done and, and the amount of equipment and supplies that you used for students in that particular lesson. And so by specifying, you know, the, the size of the sheet of paper, if it's in drafting, and uh, the number of exercises, you can get a very uh, pretty good handle on how much uh, in the way of supplies, a single student will uh, utilize in a, a, an academic year. And, so, and then you can take that amount and multiply it by the number of students that, that you uh, expect and just kind of draw off of those uh, performance objectives to see how much you're going to need the next academic year. And then, like I said, just multiply the amount of supplies needed by the number of students that you expect. And then you give yourself a little wiggle room and increase that number by 10%. And look, in real life, we're lucky if we're going to get it. But let's put it this way. Many times what will happen is that we're given an allotment and then we get it cut. Aim high. Be, be realistic because chances are you'll get cut but what the amount that you get cut may be a, a very realistic number that you can uh, utilize to uh, survive and also you can add additional objectives to your performance objectives have your students do more things and then you can kind of justify that increase in uh, supply budget by those objectives. And then last but not least, we'll always want to calculate for, for one academic year. Uh, we don't need to be looking too far ahead. Uh, we can get by from year to year to year. Uh, that'll do fine for us. Now, for those in our midst that deal with customer service type of of uh, occupations like let's say barbering or uh, uh, cosmetology those kind of programs who will use supplies on a regular basis and uh, day in and day out um, be a great thing to kind of set up accounts with supply firms uh, so in case you run out of, uh, let's say, some kind of shampoo that you can call them up 
tell them what you need, and they can have it delivered to you uh, very, very quickly. For some situations, the customers will pay for materials. Uh, back when I was in auto mechanics, student wanted to or student's parents or girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it was, uh, they could uh, go out to a parts dealership and um, buy the parts and then bring them. And then the students would put them uh, uh, on the car. And it was... Uh, great experience for for that student for him or her to be able to use the parts that they would uh, actually see if they were working in industry they won't it wouldn't have to work on some kind of uh, engine model or something like that they would actually be using uh, the real parts but certainly, the school wouldn't have the, uh, the budget to be able to, pay, to, to keep an inventory of those. So the students are those getting the, uh, the, the work done on their particular uh, thing would then bear the, uh, the cost. And that's kind of, and certainly those kind of things ought to be managed by bonded personnel especially if money changes hands. Uh, school accountants ought to take care of that. Um, and so the customers also purchase the parts, etc. like we said before. Uh, you can have a revolving type of fund. I'm not really that familiar with that one right there, but um, uh, that fund would continue to be replenished peri periodically so that you, you could buy uh, supplies when necessary. And last but certainly, uh, I would say least, an undesignated cash account, which again gets into all kinds of possibilities for, uh, for problems and innuendo where you keep it like a petty cash uh, box and students put that money in that box and then whenever you need to purchase something you do it with that. Uh, that you do not want to do. But unfortunately some instructors feel they can't live without it. And so that ends our lecture on chapter four. And so I will end this PowerPoint right here.